Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm very happy that we are starting a new stream on quantum technologies. And my good friend Reza is going to be leading that stream. And today he's going to do a quick overview of uh, what's happening in the space of quantum technologies. Hopefully as we go forward, we will be doing uh, more sessions on these on both what's happening on the quantum technology side, as well as quantum machine learning and you know applications of machine learning to quantum. Uh, and on that topic tomorrow at lunchtime, we have another session uh, where we will be talking about using uh, RNNs for um, approximating the ground state of uh, quantum systems. So um, with that, I'm going to quickly ask Reza to do a quick intro, and then we start the session by going over some concepts. Thank you so much, Amir. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Reza. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, depending upon where you are in the world. I know we are live uh, on YouTube. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as Amir mentioned, my name is Reza. I have a PhD in physics from University of Tennessee, Knoxville in USA. And then I was a postdoc for a while at Texas A&M University. Then uh, I decided to change the course and I started uh, basically a quantum computing startup named QSpice Lab here in Canada, in Toronto, thanks to Creative Destruction Lab and all the great programs that they offered and all their helps. Uh, after that, uh, I moved basically to Y Combinator in USA. Uh, the name of the company changed there to Aurora Quantum Technologies. So you might find me with both names, QSpice or Aurora Q. Uh, I am the co-founder and CTO at Aurora Quantum Technologies. Also, currently, I'm a researcher at the University of Ottawa. I work with the structured quantum optic groups here at the Department of Physics uh, and Max Planck Center for Extreme Quantum Photonics. Um, is, if there is anything else, I'm more than happy to answer, Amir. Perfect. Uh, so the way the way we usually run these sessions is that at the mm -hmm. beginning we go over uh, a bunch of concepts to make sure that everyone is on the same page as you're going to go through your presentation you're going to use these concepts so you want to make sure that everyone understand uh, what Perfect. those mean so I'm just going to throw a bunch of concepts at you and if you can give a 30 second description of each uh, then we can move on to the presentation so the first thing is a quantum bit so what is a quantum bit. Great, that's a great question. Of course, uh, everything starts with qubits in this field, uh, Amir. And qubit is basically the fundamental unit of information in quantum computing. So it's very much analogous to, to a bit in digital computing, a zero five volt uh, uh, on and off switch. So the same, is, uh, the same story in quantum information science. It's a fundamental bit of quantum information that you cannot have anything smaller than that. Mm. Okay, perfect. And uh, so, and there is this concept of multi-qubit systems. So is that essentially similar to how we have multi-bit systems in classical computing? Mm, not exactly. And that's where all the power of quantum computing comes to play. When you have multiple qubits the space that they gave you for computation grows exp exponentially. And uh, basically, if you have, let's say, two qubit, then your space would be four dimensions. And if you have three qubits, you have eight possibilities to do computation on. If you have n qubits, then there will be a two to the power of basically n. And that's where all the greatness of quantum computing and what it has to offer comes, basically. Okay, and so you, you, you use these qubits and multi-qubit systems to encode the information, as you're saying, uh, but then you need to do the computation on them, and you use quantum gates. Can you talk a little about quantum gates? Of course, exactly. Just very much similar to classical computing, you need gates to do uh, your computations. There are single qubit gates, and there are multi-qubit gates. Uh, for example, the most basically famous one is the Pauli gates. X not gates uh, is a two qubit gate. So X, Y, Z and uh, Hadamard gates, you have all those just very much similar to digital computing. 
basically one of the fundamental issues we, we have right now with quantum computing is the noise in all these gates and how long we can keep them to be basically in the quantum states. So the, the, the time that you can keep them as quantum before they decohere and the in quantum information is basically lost, that's, uh, that's how you find which qubit is, uh, which gate quantum gate is better than the other quantum gates. Okay. And so then there are single qubit gates, multi qubit gates, and multi qubit gates are the ones that you use to get the interesting effects in quantum, like entanglement. Uh, exactly. Uh, right. Can, can you talk about, you know, superpositions, entanglements, and interesting effects that you can create using multi qubit gates? Of course, that's a great question. And that's how, you know, the, the, the fundamentals of quantum computing is based on these two, uh, two phenomena that you mentioned, the superposition and also entanglement. So superposition is, is really interesting, which is the, the intrinsic of, of a quantum system. Uh, I have more slides and details about it, but in general, comparing to, to classical world, you have a zero and one, you have a turn on switch or turn off switch. In, in quantum world, it can be on zero states or it can be on one state or it can be a combination of both of these or it can be basically anything in between, zero and one and all the continuous space between them. This is basically superposition and now even more interestingly, beside one qubit, if you have multiple qubits, you can have a superposition of these qubits all together, and we call that phenomena entanglement. When two qubits or two quantum systems are in entangled system, entangled position, uh, basically what it means is if you know the quantum information about the other one of them, you know everything about the other one, no matter how far they are physically apart. It's really uh, kind of counterintuitive phenomena because we are used to know that, okay, if you have an information, it takes some time for, for that to travel to, to go to the other party. But when they are entangled in this state, they, they basically, everything is correlated between these two parties. So entanglement, you can look at it as basically a superposition between multi qubits. Okay, perfect. Uh, and just to clarify, it is a superposition between multi qubits that has particular properties. It's not any superposition. Uh, exactly. exactly. So, so you have your uh, information encoded in qubits and you have gates that you can use to do your computation. How do you put all these together? Uh, so you have this concept of quantum circuits. Exactly. So just like classical computation, you need to build circuits out of it. So you have your qubits, you have your gates, you have to put them together and build basically a quantum circuits. Quantum circuits, we can, we can fabricate them using very different technologies. A uh, very common technology right now is building them just like uh, actually the classical engineering methods is superconducting qubits. You, you are using and borrowing lots of methods from, from the classical world to put together to build these uh, QPUs or quantum processing units. Uh, the way you fabricate them is different based on which technology. So for superconducting qubits, you are using mostly superconducting material on some sort of uh, substrates such as silicon or other uh, possible substrates that in industry we use them often. And if you are using the photonic technology, it would be of course different how we put together these quantum circuits there we are mostly using, let's say, interferometers and uh, often like a Mach-Sender type interferometer. And then uh, each one has its own basically details of details that we must pay attention how to basically encode these quantum states, how to encode the information, how to manipulate information and how to read out uh, from your quantum processing unit. There are many other layers besides the physical uh, quantum unit to be able to, to, to interact with, with the QPU from you know, classical world, classical engineering, all the way to that physical quantum layer. Perfect. And 
uh, so you have your quantum information, uh, you have your circuit, and the circuit is in principle implementing some sort of algorithm uh, to, to achieve a particular objective, to do a particular task. So uh, can you talk about quantum algorithms and, you know, probably give a couple of examples of, you know, the famous ones? Sure, sure. That's a great question. There's always a classical layer. So you can't talk directly to the quantum level. So there are classical computers involved, several layers. But then at the end of the day, you must basically be able to talk to this quantum processing unit. And that's the way we do it is using quantum algorithms. We have, we have uh, quantum algorithms since 1992. So you can imagine it's not exactly brand new. Uh, the very famous uh, old one is Deutsch-Joseph algorithm. These were like uh, beginning of this field. Uh, the field basically started somewhere around 1982 by Feynman's proposed, and then uh, 1992, I believe, uh, the first quantum algorithm was developed. Uh, and it has proven that they do have a speed up advantage comparing to their classical counterparts. The, the good thing about these quantum algorithms is, for example, at a very basic level, instead of doing lots of measurements the way we do in classical computing, a consec uh, consecutive measurements, here you can do one measurements, for, uh, for example, and find the property for many possibilities. Dutch Joseph algorithm was the first one, but the very most famous one is the Shor's algorithm, which was developed in 1994 by Peter Shor. Back then he was at Bell's, now I think believe he's at MIT University. Short algorithm was the first to implement a basically quantum speed up, which is exponential speed up comparing to their classical counterparts for factorizing uh, very large integers. Why is it so important? Why is it so interesting? And why is it scary? It's because most of our digital security is based on this uh, factorizing very large prime numbers is, is a hard task. It takes perhaps millions of years uh, with classical computers to be able to do such things. But Peter Shor's algorithm was proven to, to give you a, uh, exponential speed up to factorize uh, large uh, prime numbers. And that basically kind of puts our digital security in danger. Uh, the other famous algorithm is the Grover search algorithm, which gives you uh, a little bit less you know, more moderate, basically, advantage on the speed up. So if you have basically a unstructured uh, data set, it can go through that and do a search for you. And it's proven that has uh, a speed up advantage comparing to other search algorithms, classical ones. So Peter Shor algorithm and, of course, Grover algorithm, these are like very famous examples of quantum algorithms. Awesome. That, that was a great, uh, I guess, uh, ground setting. So now that we are all on the same page, uh, let's go on and uh, listen to your talk. Thank you very much. OK, uh, so quantum technology is a brief overview. First of all, why quantum? I like this cartoon. You, you, you find it uh, in different places when they talk about quantum. Why? Why is it interesting? It's how your quantum prototype coming. Uh, well, it is simultaneous states of being both totally successful and not even started. That's kind of referring, that's this joke is referring to the superposition principles. And of course, here when it comes tricky to do the measurement, it's because when you do a measurement on a quantum system, it does change your system. We will talk about it later, but. So the system before and after measurements is not the same. Now, why we do hear a lot about quantum computing, why uh, originally I think uh, Feynman suggested that for simulating quantum systems, we, we need to move on from digital computing to quantum computing. First of all, uh, it's Moore's law. We, we need more and more computational power. Every day, we have more, basically, devices connecting to internet, internet of things, bigger data sets are created, bigger problems that we have, problems such as climate change and 
uh, these days we are uh, dealing with this whole pandemic problem, they need lots of lots of computational power. And we know building classical computing machine with those large capacities is, is hard, is very expensive and it has its own limits. And we know from the Moore's law, we, we, what we observed over past decades is the size of these transistors are getting smaller and smaller. And the number of transistors we can pack in one chip was almost doubling every 18 months or two years. But there is a fundamental physical limit to that. We can't have, uh, basically, we can't increase that. We can have less than in, in several atoms uh, thickness of these transistors and layers between. So at the end of the day, we will have problems on uh, increasing the number of transistors. And by that, there will be some limitations on our computational capacities. The main, the other maybe main problem is simulating quantum mechanical systems, many body quantum systems. It's not efficient to do simulate those trying to find uh, their properties using classical machines. The other issue that is coming up by the age of basically quantum computing is security in the age of quantum computing. As I just said, the short algorithms suggest that we can break all these cybersecurity protocols based on uh, factorizing large prime numbers. So our quantum, uh, our security in digital age would be in danger if we forget about the advent of these quantum technologies and the fact that they are coming uh, maybe, maybe in a few years, maybe in a decade, but it will happen. And then we have to worry about uh, how to securely send and transmit data over internet and how to securely basically save our data for many, many years to come. So the other uh, interesting phenomena here is the quantum computing can handle problems, which may take several years. So quantum computers naturally, intrinsically are really good at some specific type of calculations that it may take thousands of years using classical machines. So uh, I hope I convinced you that the quantum technologies are very important and we need to we need to invest time and money in them and educate next generations on how to basically be involved with this new uh, domain of technology. Uh, Qubit, Amir asked me that, is the fundamental unit of quantum information. So in classical computation, what we have is a bunch of gates, not gates, or gates, and gates, and then you have bits, zeros and ones. And this is how you put together to build a basically a classical circuit to do computation using logical gates. Now, we have this similar uh, components in quantum world. We have Hadamard gates. It's very useful. I will, I may this describe it a little bit. It's, uh, we use it to basically generate entangled states from pure states. And then the, uh, this is uh, the symbol for not gate kind of like that one, and here you do the measurement. That's what, that's the symbol for measurements in quantum circuits. You have uh, one line here, meaning uh, these are quantum information, and then the two lines means after measurements, your data is no longer quantum, and it is classical information, and you need classical devices to read it. That's a representation of a qubit. We usually use this, uh, it's called Bloch sphere. It's a very good mathematical tool for visualization to see how a qubit look like. You have two bits, zero and one. And, but it's not just that, it can be anywhere on the surface of this S-sphere. The S-sphere has a length, basically the, the radius of this is one. The pure states lies on the surface of the block S-sphere. And you can see makes a representation of qubits and where they are than the quantum states much, much easier and closer to understand. 
Okay, quantum information processing. Quantum information was originally suggested by Feynman. Uh, he has a paper in 1982 published about simulating physics with computers, and he suggests and proves mathematically that doing this with classical computers is, is never going to be efficient process. These days, we hear a lot of news about quantum supremacies. People love to, to announce their they achieved quantum supremacy. I personally don't like this word. Uh, I don't know who first time mentioned this, uh, this uh, basically concept of quantum supremacy, but in, in a very, very nutshell, very simple uh, language, we can say, okay, by increasing the number of bits or qubits, comparing quantum computers with classical computers, there is a certain number of qubits uh, that after that, a quantum computer will surpass any classical computer, and that's the point of quantum supremacy. So your quantum computer will be better at a specific type of problems if they have this many qubits. Now, this is a bit tricky because qubit itself is, when we talk about qubits, we are often talking about uh, physical qubits, how many qubits you can physically built on a chip or how many of these you can have in a photonic processor. But that's not how we do the computation. You need logical qubits. And to have logical qubits, you need many, 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 basically, of those physical qubits. But anyway, we will describe this a little bit later more in details. There are two main type of, basically, quantum information processing. Two type of you can build these quantum pouring machines. First, uh, and really, the one that everybody is trying to, to do and the holy grail is the gate-based quantum computing. This is universal. This is general purpose quantum computer. I imagine you have a quantum computer that at least for certain type of problems can behave just like a, your classical computer. So you can write an algorithm for it and get it uh, and do your computation. On the other hand, there is a more limited version of quantum computing called quantum annealing. Uh, this is really good for cert very, very certain type of problems, such as optimization problems. This type has been commercialized by, by D-Wave systems many years ago. It's been achieved. Uh, so quantum annealing is the other, other type of basically quantum computing. So what we do in quantum information, I just showed you a block sphere. What we are dealing with is quantum states and quantum, uh, instead of zeros and one here, you prepare your quantum states. They are in superposition. We have to put them in superposition states and then you, you, you encode them on your quantum, basically layers of computation. Uh, you do all the, manipulations using your gates, quantum gates, and then you have to basically read the information, do the measurement. Uh, quantum measurements are actually like very tricky, it's different from what we do in classical world, but it, uh, as a general rule in quantum physics, when, when an observer do a measurement, it changes the quantum states of the system. So the system won't be the same as before the measurement. So in general, we are exploiting basically quantum entanglement and quantum superposition. Also, sometimes we call, we call it quantum inter interference uh, to do your computation. It's intrinsically probabilistic. So it's very different from what we are used to, which is deterministic co uh, computation. Here, you don't have that determination. You have prob probabilities, but the good news is Basically, a uh, lots of times these these probabilities when you do a com computation and do the measurement, they kind of fall very much near the the right answer. So if you do the computation enough number of times, at the end of the day, you will have you will have an answer which is very very close or the exact answer basically to your problem. But you can imagine it's not going to work for all problems. Perhaps you don't want to do such a thing for running an app on your phone. But if you had a problem such as, for example, you know, quantum chemistry problems, that there are many, 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 many possible solutions to, to, to a problem, but only one of them is the real answer that you need or 
just getting close to that answer is good enough this will be very efficient way while you know in, in classical computation you must go through each and every one of those solutions one by one and then measure it and see okay is this the right answer no let's go to the next one next possibility in quantum world you can do all of them at the same time and then get your uh per probabilistic answer to that problem okay so I mentioned quantum technologies. I didn't say quantum computation. Why? Because there are many other technologies. And as a matter of fact, lots of them, so, some of them are much, much closer to be actually be commercialized, to, to be uh, industrialized and practically be used than quantum computation, at least the gate-based general purpose quantum computation. But uh, the biggest promise and the biggest hope and challenge is in the quantum computation part, of course. Uh, this is this interesting kind of look like a chandelier is, you know, IBM quantum computer and you see them everywhere uh, on the internet, these really interesting photos. Basically, they have several layers. This is, uh, of course, a superconducting uh, quantum computer. You have all these cables everything is gold plated and there are reasons for it many many cables they bring microwave signals your quantum processor is somewhere right here we know you know outside board is around you know the room temperature and then here you you reach like few kelvin and few kelvin and here your quantum processor is basically sitting at milli kelvin uh, basically colder than interspace uh temperature and you can imagine how much energy and how much money and how much technology must be you know invested in these machines to reach these kinds of temperatures uh, there's a reason for it uh, some of these cables are bringing basically signals to manipulate to to encode the data to manipulate and some of them are turning back uh, the quantum information after the uh, after the manipulation basically your computation is done. So quantum computation is one part, quantum communication is, is the other section of interest. It has been uh, basically already tested. China, several years ago, they sent you know a satellite that is capable of doing quantum communication, very long distance between China and Austria. This particular figure that I have here is from our, uh, our group here at the University of Ottawa. The SQO group uh, recently has been published. It's very interesting and first of its own kind. It's quantum communication underwater. This experiment was performed under uh, Ottawa River. Interestingly, it has been done in, in some pools of water to practically show that you can do this basically quantum, in, quantum information communication even underwater. Uh, for some special purposes. And uh, our group has done this even uh, over the city of uh, Ottawa. Uh, it's very much basically uh, ready to be commercialized. Uh, and quantum communication is the answer to the threats that basically quantum computation may bring to our, you know, to, to our internet and to our uh, data security. The other part, the other section is very much under uh, lots of lots of research is quantum machine learning. People have been using quantum uh, computers, even the very limited NISC era quantum computers that we have already and quantum annealing machines that we already have to, to do some quantum machine learning and to prove that this, uh, some of those algorithms, protocols of quantum machine learning can be benefited from quantum computers uh, protein folding, it has been proven that can can be benefited. There are companies that I know of in, in Toronto, they are working uh, on basically solving this very complicated, uh, that it takes very long time or almost impossible using classical computers to do a exact computation just because proteins are very big, big molecules. Uh, they are trying to employ quantum computation and those algorithms to do to to simulate these bio processes and do some biology and chemistry calculations. 
The other part is quantum sensing. Uh, already there are companies which do have commercially available basically of these sensors that are uh, working based on phenomena, quantum mechanical phenomena such as superposition and entanglement. Uh, that's basically perhaps the closest one to be commercialized. Of course, the other application for quantum technologies is quantum simulations, quantum chemistry, because qu quantum chemistry, you are usually dealing with big molecules. Big molecules are made out of many, many atoms. Uh, digital computers, it's uh, next to impossible to, to get an exact solution for these types of problems. So we have to come up with very smart approximations, but of course, approximations are just approximations and even them work only for a small to medium sized molecules. So for bigger molecules and for having a more accurate results, you need, you need a different type of calculations besides basically the digital computing quantum simulations can, can really revolutionize this field and everything that's connected, related to it, such as pharmaceuticals. Uh, quantum engineering, designing new materials is the, another big promises of uh, quantum computers. Also, you can think about this quantum engineering is coming up with innovations, ideas that can, you know, create uh, materials and phenomena that you need to do quantum, let's say other branch, such as quantum computation. So many people are working on basically enabling technologies that you need because these uh, building these quantum computing machines needs a very special type of materials, very special, as I mentioned, for example, about the, uh, the temperature that they are working uh, at. It's very special and it needs a uh, basically what we call quantum engineering to, to enable those other quantum technologies. To come around. So beside all of that, finance, optimization, simulation, and sampling problems, they can be benefited from the advent of quantum technologies, and they all have uh, basically problems that can be answered using quantum technologies. Now, I mentioned qubits, and qubits are the uh, basically the fundamental bits of quantum information. Uh, how do you build this physically? How do you build them? So it's very interesting. Uh, people have used different technologies, such as superconducting qubits. They use trapped ions. They use NMR machines, photonic based, topological bits, and spin bits. So superconducting is one of the most promising one. Major companies and the startups they are they invested heavily in this technology. Here you have a microscopic system instead of uh, you know using ions or atoms, you have a microscopic system of superconducting materials, superconducting circuits, often LC circuits. Uh, there is different flavors of them. There are charge qubits, there are uh, flux qubits. People are now investigating a uh, whole lot of transmon qubits. Uh, these are basically LC circuits made out of superconducting materials. And uh, the, the major drawback here is they work on very low temperatures around, around millikelvin, which makes things a little bit more expensive and limited. But uh, there are lots of pr promises using superconducting qubits. And uh, I think a very important uh, aspect of it is we already know how to design, how to fabricate these kinds of qubits based on our classical engineering and classical experience that we have. So we employ those methods in fabricating this type. Of course, there's trapped ions. Uh, trapped ions is one of the more mature ways of building uh, qubits. They are scalable. Uh, I don't want to get into all the details of it, but mm -hmm. This, ha this has lots of promises. There is a company called IonQ. They are pioneering in commercializing this type of quantum computers. NMR machines has been used. Uh, in NMR, you are using basically the nuclei spin uh, for as your qubits. And to, to probe these qubits, you are using basically the strong, uh, basically magnetic field to probe the quantum states as we usually do for, quant for NMR spectroscopy here. We can use that for doing quantum computation. 
this myth that has been more or less proven that's not scalable. That's why perhaps you don't hear a lot about it. Photonic qubit, you can build basically qubits based on this Mach center interferometers and other basically uh, photonic elements in uh, silicon substrate or other basically substrates, but silicon is often more or less industry standard. Uh, people have been investing hugely in this field. There's, there's a company with lots of promises, Psy Quantum in California, that they are promising to bring uh, this type of chips to market. Uh, there are other companies that are working on specialized, basically photonic-based quantum computing for, for example, for neural networks and for machine learning uh, uh, specialized uh, circuits. Topological qubits, uh, basically this is working based on a concept called anions. Uh, Microsoft has spent lots of money on this, invested for many years. Uh, they, they, we haven't been successful in physically implementing that, but if, if we do, it's the most uh, basically noise resistant type of qubits if we uh, are able to, to, to engineer them uh, in labs. That's what makes them very much interesting. So that's the Microsoft way, and you can consider this ones as IBM or Google way of building qubits. Of course, you can use the spin of an electron or even nuclear spin in calculations. This is an NV center, basically a nitrogen vacancy center. Some people suggested this might be very much uh, the holy grail, but we have engineering issues with where to put them. Uh, that's why you don't hear lots of commercial companies working in this field, but more or less it's an ongoing research on how to use them to build qubits. Already, it's interesting that there are many, many, many quantum program languages. Uh, I have not listed, of course, most of them here. I have only a few examples. Even so, we do not have these practical, you know, quantum computers yet, but there are many languages. Uh, and these languages are waiting for us to invent those quantum, basically, hardware that is required. So if anyone is interested to start from, you know, if you want to start from somewhere, I uh, definitely suggest QSKIT from IBM Q. There are many flavors of it. It's designed for, you know, uh, what you want to do, basically. But it has a great uh, documentation, and it's very easy to learn. And there's a huge community around it. Google, uh, IBM did a great job in building this community. So if you need help, there's always help there. There's QSharp from Microsoft. Uh, also, there are, you know, other languages such as QCL, of course, some of the companies, some of the startups, they do develop their own languages. Sometimes it's specialized. For example, this is Strawberry Fields. Uh, sometimes um, it's for quantum computing. Sometimes it's for machine learning, it's specialized around that concept. So, for example, this forest from Rigetti, they have PyQuill or gate model is a Python libraries uh, that you can use in building your own applications. So there are already quantum programming languages if you are interested to go and learn. Quantum machine learning, uh, definitely I'm not an expert in quantum machine learning or machine learning. I'm sure uh, we will have better guests who are expert in that field. I just want to take a moment to remember our very good friend, Peter Vitek. He was our advisor. He had the first book in the world, to the best of my knowledge, quant a, a book named Quantum Machine Learning. Perhaps these days there are more than one, but three, four years ago when I started this field, this was the only book. Uh, we don't have Peter with us for, I think, more than a year now. Quantum Machine Learning. So I said quantum computing is, by its nature, probabilistic. And it is based on, basically, uh, linear algebra. So what we know in quantum machine learning, lots of those protocols and good methods, they are, they, they are based on probabilities and they are based on linear algebra. So you can see the, uh, the connection that how you, we might use this, this type of computation to, to gain advantage uh, in basically like speed or other properties that's important to you, maybe accuracy. 
uh, to have better quantum machine learning protocols. Okay, how can quantum computers help machine learning and artificial intelligence? Quantum computing is intrinsic, intrinsically probabilistic and also it's based on linear algebra. So adiabatic quantum computing, those annealing machines that I said, they are really good at optimization problems and in machine learning, often you are dealing with optimization type problems. Uh, there are sometimes what we call quantum enhanced or quantum inspired ways. They might not be exactly quantum. They are not using quantum phenomena like the superposition, but they are inspired by, by those type of algorithms. And then of course there is the quantum sampling techniques that makes it faster. There are already a fully optical neural network has already been experimentally implemented. So you can see, for example, this paper from Nature uh, they are suggesting that they build basically circuits and hardware to implement deep learning with, with basically photonic based quantum computation. Uh, there are there, companies do have basically already uh, uh, packages, libraries ready for to be used in quantum machine learning. For example, Forest from Rigetti, and of course the Penny Lane from Xanadu there in Prono. Uh, these are libraries to do and implement quantum machine learning. They also, of course, they are building hardware for it. We're still waiting for that. Uh, so yeah, quantum machine learning has lots of lots of promises. Now, Beside, beside the number of qubits, you, you hear a lot about like companies like to, to announce this news about how many qubits uh, they achieved. Uh, but beside the number of qubits, there are many other factors that must be considered. Uh, I'm doing on time. Okay, I guess I'm almost done on time. But there are many other, uh, other uh, important, basically, considerations to take into account including error and noise and stability of our gates. What we have already, uh, it's sometimes it's really good, but it's far from what we have classically. So there are lots of errors and noises in these systems, and we are still dealing with them. Uh, we are trying to have better hardware. We are trying to have codes uh, for error corrections. And by using a combination of that, uh, basically being able to have a scalable quantum computers and have gates with good enough coherence time that you can implement many of these gates and do a long, basically a big computation without them decohere and go to basically classical uh, state or basically the noise in the system destroy your quantum computation. So we must consider all of those. Uh, also the concept of connectivity, uh, how this qubits are connected to each other, how they are talking to each other, and how you isolate them from not talking to the uh, outside board. This is really an interesting uh, graph here we have. I, uh, I, I'm kind of thinking that I'm at the end of my time, not a long time, so I try to be faster. Right now where we are, we are at this stage, okay, by time. And this is where basically superconducting qubits are and we are promising that superconducting qubits are ready to go to the next stage. So you see we have seven stage to achieve to have basically fault tolerant quantum computation. That's the final goal. Fault tolerant quantum computation, of course, in, in, in for general purpose. Right now we are here still after 20 years of R&D and research. Uh, superconducting are going to the next stage, other uh, technologies such as trapped ion or Rydberg atoms, they already reached this third stage. So you can see uh, this is your physical qubits, but besides physical qubits, you need algorithms or multiple phys physical qubits to build logical qubits and then quantum non demolition and measurements. And from there, you get to logical memories with longer lifetime. And from there to operating on single logical qubits and eventually fault tolerant quantum computation. That's our goal. Uh, this is another way of looking at basically a quantum processing unit. You have the physical layer. This is those atoms or superconducting 
qubits, whatever you have, whatever you're using as your technology. But then from there, you need to connect to, to all these layers to be able to basically implement an application. Uh, there are lots of research in how to build links to link. Basically, you need quantum links to connect this to distribute your quantum computation because that's another way to get around the problem of noise and scalability, the problems that you had. And we discussed we can distribute a quantum computation between several chips instead of trying to build one basically perfect chip. But anyway, you see there are several layers beside the quantum between the hardware and the quantum computing algorithms and languages for addressing and how to start the computation. Now, ecosystem and commercial landscape, this is basically something that I'm really interested to talk to you, uh, to talk to you about and hopefully convince you that there are lots of opportunities uh, in these fields to start uh, startups to or to at least start getting really excited about and interested about and follow up and try to learn as much as you can because this is coming, believe it or not, there are already basically VCs such as Quantonation in France that they invested a lot of uh, money in quantum startups. There are VCs that are specialized and they only invest in quantum technologies. I'm sure there are more than one. So you can imagine where we are right now. These are more or less, you know, getting ready to be commercialized and to be widely available. So uh, where you can enter this market, how you can contribute to these fields. So either you can, you can start as software and consultant. You can see there are lots of companies already doing uh, developing softwares, basically what we call quantum readiness. They consult with companies of how you know they can be benefited from, from quantum computation or how their business can be affected by invent, uh, by the advent of quantum computers. There are many of them. Uh, basically in Canada, you have one qubit, you have protein cure, uh, of course, quantum benchmark in Waterloo region. These are Canadian companies that I know of. Uh, Horizon Quantum, it's in Singapore. Uh, so software, Consultation, the other side, which is a little bit, of course, harder to get involved with, is, a, is, is the hardware sector. Uh, these are usually, as you can see, major companies with billions of dollars would be a little bit tough to compete with. But of course, you know, there are many companies, that are, there, there has been in history that small startups came and they now fairly large uh, or medium sized companies. They are working in these fields. They are enabling technologies. So if you don't want to build the whole thing, like a full stack quantum computer, you can start with enabling technologies. This is QSPY's Labs. It's my uh, original startup with the original logo. But there are other companies, like for example, this Blue Force company. Okay, they are really interesting, and they they have a very interesting story. If you have time to go read about them. Uh, they were postdocs, they were working on this field, they were dealing with uh, dilution refrigerators, which I showed you in, in, in that IBM quantum computing photo. We need to have them in millikelvin, so what they decided is, okay, instead of building quantum computers, we built those dilution refrigerators, and now it's a very good business. Uh, there are many companies who want to buy those type, and there is not many companies who offer these kinds of technologies. So you can, you can start from somewhere like that if you're interested in the hardware companies. And of course, there are other companies that they are uh, specialized in building uh, components or some, some enabling pieces that other companies such as you know, the big players can use to build the real quantum computers. Beside all of that, uh, there's basically these uh, ecosystems let's say, around the globe that they are investing lots of money and they are specialized in helping in starting uh, quantum startups. They are accelerators for it and they are incubators for it. For example, in Toronto, there is Creative Destruction Lab. They have a quantum machine learning stream. You can apply there and they help you with some fundings and lots of uh, basically advisory time. It's a great uh, way to start if you are interested to have a quantum uh, company, quantum startup, now either being it machine learning or other areas that we can see. Now, there are lots of promises already of uh, about the 
uh, the com commercial aspects of it, BCG, the Boston Consulting, uh, they, they suggested that, you know, in, in the next five years, it can be the, the market size for quantum technologies can be as big as two to five billion dollars. So you can imagine it's already a big market and it is a young market, so it's easier to access those. And in the basically next, uh, next decades, it can go up to something around even up to $50 billion, uh, the total market. Now, considering big industries such as like pharmaceuticals or major uh, chemistry companies and chemical companies and companies that are dealing with, uh, with inventing new materials. So overall, this can be a huge market, lots of opportunities later. But uh, as you can see, software has the biggest promise, but beside that there is hardware and of course services. And you can, you can see from even this Kager number, it's growing with 30%, which shows that the market is gonna be uh, pretty much a big and uh, VC friendly market. It's big enough. Governments around the world are investing a lot in, in quantum technologies. China, we don't know exactly how much, but we know it's more than basically billions of dollars. So it's multi-billion dollars. Uh, United States, they, they, they have $1.2 billion plans for quantum technologies and EU, the European Union has a 1 billion euro flagship to basically to be invested in quantum technologies in the next 10 years. So, so far, just, just a very major uh, startups in, in the field, such as, you know, companies like INQ, SciQuantum, OneQubit, they raised more than $500 million. I'm sure there's way more than the 500 million from private fundings. Uh, so you can imagine this is a field to basically to get really interested in if you are uh, thinking about being an entrepreneur and starting your companies. There are lots of fundings available. So what are the key challenges in starting these kinds of companies? Right now, to, to, to have that quantum revolution, most, I think the biggest problem right now is the talent. We need lots of lots of people with different expertise who can basically come and contribute from you know computer engineers uh, to quantum engineers, quantum physicists. Uh, so talent, shortage of talent in quantum technologies is something that we already know it exists and it will be huge in, in next uh, years and in decades. Uh, so if you are, I don't know, young and you are looking for new fields of research and study, you can think about quantum technologies. There is supply and demand uh, issues on, as I said, those parts and uh, components, they're very specialized. There are not many companies who can sell you those. Uh, sometimes com different companies, they, they're not still sure that they need to, to know and what these quantum technologies can bring for them. So you have to educate companies, you have to educate your customers. Uh, also, there's the capital issue sometimes for some small startups, reaching capital is the other issue. We need talent, talent you need, besides quantum physicists, you need people with talents and expertise in like material science, electronics, cryogenics, nanofabrication, and computer science. So it's not just uh, basically quantum physicists. Supply, okay, we need components. These are very, very specialized components. Sometimes, you know, even finding these cables, it's hard. Not many companies can, can do that for you because they are very much specialized. Uh, in engineering, we never had to consider all these very, very uh, small quantum phenomena. But here, for your quantum computer to work, you must consider those. And to have the, to, to to make this work, you need very specialized components. So we need those kinds of companies. For basically quantum communication, we need the infrastructure. The current infrastructure data is not exactly something that you can implement all the quantum protocols. And also, of course, you, we need a scalable, practical quantum computers if you want to do some serious quantum computation. Okay, to have a quantum ecosystem, basically what we need, we need a quantum ecosystem that can bring user facilities. Then you don't have to buy or 
you know, pay a lot of money to have access to quantum computers, some shared facilities. You need, we need mentorship. These are brand new. So mentors that can advise you to have to how to start a quantum company and how to grow a quantum compute quantum computing company. That's something that uh, is is in high demand, and we need those kinds of people. Partnership with perhaps government agencies, government to be your first customer would be helpful. Of course, partnership with universities, with research institute will be very helpful for small startups when they want to start. And always, always cash is the king and we need cash uh, if you want to have a quantum startup. So just to introduce you real quick, uh, some resources if you are now interested to go learn more about quantum computing, Something there are great, great resources. You don't need just to, you know, buy textbooks. There is IBM Quantum Experience online, QSKIT. They they do have open source. They have plenty of resources available online on YouTube. You can reach. It's very much well documented. Uh, Microsoft has lots of resources to learn. Uh, of course, other companies such as Xanadu, they have Penny Lane, they have a strawberry field open source softwares for photonic quantum computing. These, these are capable of matching and, you know, working with QSkit. Uh, uh, you can use these libraries from Rigetti and of course the D-Wave system, they have their own leap and uh, some, some of these companies even let you and allow you to use a real quantum computer with of course, few limited qubits, like five qubits, six qubit, 11 qubits. And you can basically just play around and get a good feeling of how it works and think about how you can build greater applications to use these uh, currently available resources. It's not exactly uh, practical now, but we can learn from them and we can use them as a stepping stone to go to the next levels. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Reza, for the great talk. Um, fortunately, we don't have a ton of time for questions, but I'm going to just ask a few very quick questions. Of course. Uh, Shijo from the audience is asking, um, maybe try to do very quick, like 30 seconds response. Uh, can you talk a little about error correction? How do you uh, achieve that on, on machines? Sure, there are several uh, basically codes for error corrections. Most uh, famous one is basically surface error corrections. Uh, and, you know, beside the hardware part, you can use these codes and these algorithms to to count for all the errors that is caused by basically the uh, imperfections in your physical system. And doing so, you will have basically uh, more reliable uh, computations and results. But there are quotes like surface code. If you want more information, you can look into the surface code for error correction. Perfect. Uh, and uh, I also have a question myself. Uh, I was a little. Uh, surprised that you know software was the most high potential part of uh, the prediction about the market size. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, you know, I, I it's probably my lack of knowledge, but uh, I'm not exactly sure what the software quantum companies are trying to achieve right now, given that we don't have scalable hardware yet. Uh, so, how reliable is this prediction that the software is going to be the biggest? market given that we don't have the hardware yet. Like that's a very conditional uh, assessment it feels. Exactly, exactly. So maybe this is kind of, you know, very much an optimistic uh, estimation of we will have quantum hardwares or we will have NISC era quantum hardwares, the noisy intermediate scale quantum hardwares. So our quantum hardwares are not perfect, but if you can imagine having a quantum hardware that has like, let's say a hundred good qubits you still are able to do some, some good computation. Now, I guess these estimations and these predictions is based on, okay, we're gonna have hardwares. There are some companies that built the hardware for you. And then there will be many companies that using basically software technologies to build applications for quantum hardwares. And that's where the big 
money is and that's where the market is you know so assumption here is there will be good enough quantum computers otherwise of course the market is not going to be so huge consultant and services it's always there you know there are already several major companies doing consulting in this field okay perfect so we had uh, 1 p.m. EDT and at the end of our time. Uh, I really appreciate you put the time in to, to give us uh, this talk today. Of and course. hopefully of course. the audience uh, can go to AI.science and create an account there and follow all the events that are coming up in all our streams uh, involving machine learning or now you're starting quantum technology. Uh, hopefully you get notified about what's happening and I'm looking forward to the sessions that Reza will be organizing going forward. Uh, thank you all and hope to see you in the future. Thank you.